Good morning. I'm glad you could be with me today as we continue to look at God's Word together in the Unfolding the Word series. We're in Daniel. Yesterday we began to look at chapter 2 of Daniel. I want to read some of the opening verses in chapter 2 this morning. Chapter 2, verse 1 of Daniel. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. And then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, be summoned to tell the king his dreams. And so they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I've had a dream, and thy spirit is troubled to know the dream. And then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, wait forever, tell us, tell us the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. <laughs> Chapter 1 introduced us to Daniel and his three friends. And it introduced us to a childhood in crisis as they were ripped away from their homes, from their homeland in their early teen years by the armies of the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, part of God's discipline upon a rebellious Judah. They encountered an ongoing crisis as they were forced into this indoctrination program and training program that was three years in length, but it ended with great fruit in at the end of chapter one as they passed with flying colors. Chapter 2 moves us yet into another crisis occurring pretty shortly after the end of the first one. Yesterday I talked about the fact that facing continuing crises is just part of what life is about in the midst of a fallen world. We should never be surprised by that. And we should always understand, as children of God, God has reasons for permitting the crises. He is accomplishing things that we can't hardly understand at times, but we need to trust him with it. Daniel is now, due to his promotion, and along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, part of the Magi order, the intelligentsia of the day. They were the king's advisors. And he is now facing death along with all of the rest of the advisors because of their inability to do what the king wanted them to do which, of course, was not only to interpret the dream, but to tell the king the dream that he'd had without him telling him the dream. In other words, they had to show that they knew the dream and the interpretation. And, of course, none of them could do it. And later on in verses 12 and 13, the king was angry and furious, and he commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. And so the order went out to kill them all. That's where we encounter Daniel and his friends, now facing the penalty of death. Yesterday, we ended by talking a little bit more about Babylon, and I want to continue that today and also talk a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar uh, before we then unfold this chapter, because I think it's important for us to understand the context of this book of Daniel, and particularly the second chapter. Yesterday, we saw how Babylon was the town founded by Nimrod, we read about it in Genesis chapter 10. It was a center for his pride, an expression of his leadership as a warrior king, uh, sort of the template that has been followed by secular Gentile nations ever since, the strong ruler who then controls a people. Now, let's move on and talk a bit more about Babylon. Babylon from the time of its founding by Nimrod, became a symbol of human pride and therefore, correspondingly, human rebellion against God from its very earliest days. After the time of Nimrod, Babylon was the place where the Tower of Babel was erected. Genesis 11 tells us about that tower. And you remember the tower was a place where rebel humanity rejected God's command to spread across the earth 
in the years following the flood. Instead, they said, we are going to build this, stay here. And as, as Genesis 11 tells us, they make the phrase, make a name for ourselves. <laughs> Instead of seeing that I am a creature, I have been created by God, my goal is to exalt God and to serve him and fulfill his purposes for creating me. Instead, we are going to make a name for ourselves. Now, you remember the story, and God disciplined humanity by confusing their languages and scattering them despite their best intentions <laughs> or their main intention, and they began to fulfill, reluctantly perhaps, God's call on them to spread across the earth. At the time of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon had continued to be a center of pride and rebellion. It had become, under Nebuchadnezzar, the largest city of the ancient world. It was an awe-inspiring city. It, it would have been a place where making a name for ourselves, the problem at the Tower of Babel, would have had its ultimate expression. It would have fostered pride. It was a city with high gates. There were 11 miles of walls around the city, protecting it. Within the city of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar had erected the Hanging Gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, filled with hydraulics and uh, the movement of water in ways that had previously not been possible. It was a city not just for Nebuchadnezzar and not just for his era, but throughout the ancient world that held a mystique, an aura. Other empires, even when it wasn't their capital, still continued to see Babylon as sort of the center of things. To me, it's very interesting that centuries later, Alexander, with the expansion of the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great, intended that he to use Babylon as the capital of his empire. He still remembered, because the culture did, that Babylon was the center town. But when he was in Babylon, he died at an early age and never could turn the city into what he intended it to be, which was the center city of his universe, of his world. By the way, the Bible tells us that Babylon will emerge one more time in human history as the center city, the center of pride, the center of rebellion against God. And of course, that will be under the Antichrist in those years before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's Babylon. That's where Daniel has found himself. And that's where this crisis of chapter 2 occurs. Now, just a couple of words about Nebuchadnezzar, too. Nebuchadnezzar was the proud king of this vast empire. Historians and writers, even back into that period, are united in identifying him as a gifted leader in general, without a peer. In other words, he stood alone in his capabilities and the respect that people had for him. Maybe they didn't like him, but they respected him. His empire grew at a rate never before seen. Within 20 years, they had conquered the entire area, the entire region, and united together into a single empire. He was a prideful man. He thought that what he had accomplished would last forever. <laughs> he would start in motion a, uh, a dynasty, let's put it that way, that would continue to control human history in the centuries that were yet to come. We know something about his heart in all of these things. Uh, later on in Daniel chapter 4, where that chapter is really about how God broke his pride, but in Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 to 30, we read these words. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this the great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, is the royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? <laughs> he was exceedingly gifted man without peer, accomplished tremendous things militarily, politically, scientifically, but he was blinded by pride and he was a rebel 
against God. He reflects 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, which tells us not to love the world or the things in the world, for the things in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are not from God. Pride of life there is the pride in what we think we can accomplish and believe that we have the answers within ourselves. Nebuchadnezzar was the epitome of pride of life. And his pride is one of the overarching themes in the first part of the book of Daniel. And God, in chapter 4, breaks his pride, and we see Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar finally come to his senses. Well, enough of these introductory remarks. I hope they're useful to you. Tomorrow, we move forward into chapter and begin to see God's purpose in this dream that he sent Nebuchadnezzar. God bless.